Let's take a look at leak codes 1056, confusing number one, and leak code 1088, confusing number two. So the reason I have to go through confusing number one is because uh, this logic will carry over to confusing number two. Um, and uh, confusing number two will build upon it, but you'll still need to understand the core logic here, which is how to determine if a number is considered a confusing number. So let's look at what this means. So we're given a number and we want to uh, see if this number is considered a confusing number. So how do we do that? There's two main, there's two main checks that we have to make to, to determine if it's a confusing number or not. So the first check is that, um, I'll talk about the two checks later, let's just see what their description is. So a confusing number is, is a confusing number if when you rotate all the digits by 180 degrees, it becomes a different number than what it was originally. So um, there's act, it, they actually told us that there's only, f so there's 10 total digits, right, in, in all of the numbers that exist. So five of the digits can be rotated 180 degrees and still be a valid, you know, number, right? But there's five other digits, two, three, four, five, seven, when they're rotated 180 degrees, like think about if you were to rotate three 180 degrees, right? It's not even a valid number after it's rotated. So, um, so, so back, going back to the two checks, the first check we should do is if there's any number in this input, if there's any digit in this input that isn't um, in this set, um, so, so basically in other words, in this input, if any digit is of two, three, four, five, or seven, then just immediately return false because um, it's not even gonna be valid after rotating 180 degrees. Then the second check is basically to check um, if, you know, so after the first pass, we've, we, we've um, already determined that the digits are all within these five numbers, um, zero, one, nine, eight, and six. So then what we have to check next is that after you rotate it 180 degrees, it's a different number than what it started out to be. So um, uh, these are just some basic things. Um, you can read over this if you want. I already talked about this, but um, yeah. So, so one good example case is 1681. So we can see that all the digits are valid. And then, um, so after you rotate this 180 degrees, it actually becomes 1891. So that's different from the original number. So it is considered a confusing number. Um, something that is not considered a confusing number is 916. Even though 916 consists of all valid digits, you know, digits from the set of 01986, if you rotate this 180 degrees, it becomes, it stays the same number. So it is not considered a confusing number. So yeah, so basically what we can do is we can do two passes. So the first pass, just check to make sure all the digits are valid, aka they're all falling in this set, 01986. And then um, then the second pass, you can just reverse the string. Um, so, so 1681 becomes 1861. Um, and then you go through this reverse string and then swap all the numbers that have a transformation um, so, so basically what I mean by that is um, if you rotate the number 6, 180 degrees, it actually becomes 9. So this, this 6 has to be a 9 here. And um, yeah, that's how we get 1891. I mean, just think about it. If you were to look at this number, if you were to rotate your head or turn the screen like 180 degrees, it would represent the number 1891. So, yep, that's how we conclude that this is a valid confusing number okay let's take a look at part two now so this seems pretty straightforward once you understand this um, okay in part two we're asked to um, we're given an input number and we're asked to find how many confusing numbers there are from between one and that input number so as an example, they gave us 20. So there's six confusing numbers between one and 20 inclusive. So that's six 
9, 10, 16, 18, and 19. You can go and check all these and flip them all by 180 degrees and they all become different numbers. So that's why um, these are all considered confusing numbers. So how do we actually do that? You know, We could just bre brute force O of n time and just go through every number one all the way up until that number 20. But um, our constraints are pretty high, right? So we have 1 billion, uh, we have 1 billion numbers. I mean, the, the input number could be 1 billion. So we might have to do a, we might have to look at all 1 billion numbers and um, that will be a time limit exceeded. So usually when the constraints are this high, you should be thinking of some logarithmic approach or um, something, you know, more creative than just um, a linear scan. Okay, so what can we do? We can use backtracking. So if you haven't already done like the combo combinations problem or permutations problem, maybe you should start with that first before trying to approach this. Um, because maybe, I mean, I'm going to try, I'm still going to try my best to explain backtracking and how you can visualize it. But I think that you could, uh, there's other videos on YouTube and you should maybe try those other problems first. Um, I mean, this one's, really not that involved at all. Basically, you're just going to try to backtrack and create all the combinations using these valid digits. And then um, you're just going to see if that created number is a valid confusing number by just passing it into like a helper function, which you can just copy over that same code from the first part and then just create that as a helper function and then just pass in every number you create into that helper function to check if it's a valid confusing number. And so um, I'm going to explain why this backtracking approach is actually um, a factor of, it's a time complexity of log n instead of O of n. Um, but yeah, so basically let's just see what we're going to do. So we're going to just try to create all the combinations of numbers um, using these 0, 1, 9, 8, 6. So I've drawn out like the recursive structure here. And pretty much um, you, you're going to just start from one and uh, e each each of these digits is going to have its own kind of recursive call tree. So let's look at how we construct this. Um, so if we have if we start at the one tree, then what this means is one is going to be our leftmost um, digit in this newly created number. And so we're going to just try to add all these uh, five numbers. We're going to tack it on to the end of one. So um, from this tree, we'll have the options of 1, 0, uh, so, so 10, then 11, 16, 18, and 19. And then from this 10, we'll, we'll add um, all of these five digits to the end of it again. So 100, 101, 106, 108, 109. And then you can imagine that 10, 100 will have um, 1000, 1001, 1006, 1008, 1009. So you can see that each uh, iteration, we're pretty much just going to append, we're going to just create all the combinations, aka we're going to append all of these five numbers to the end of the current number. And so another example is just if we start at the eight tree, then we'd have uh, 80, 81, 86, 88, 89. And then with 89, you can see that 89 becomes um, 890 and then 891, 896, 898, 899. So um, yes, right, we're not actually looking at every number from zero to um, n. We're gonna just look at all of these. We're only gonna look at the numbers that we're creating. And um, I'll break down the time complexity in a second. And uh, let, me, let me just go over one more thing. And that is, um, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna explore this zero tree because think about it. Like I said, this, this number at the top represents the number at, that's the leftmost digit in the newly created number. <clears throat> if 0 is the leftmost number, then the first level would consist of 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 6, 0, 8, 0, 9. And um, if you look at that, that's, a, that's already existing here. All those numbers, 0, 0, 1, 0, 6, 0, 8, 0, 9, those are the numbers that we're starting with. So that's, so if we have to do one level, if, if it takes one um, level to get to that, uh, from our zeroth tree, but this is our zeroth level here, then uh, it's kind of just going to be repeating numbers over and over again um, unnecessarily. So if we look at another example, 
um, from this 0, 1 branch, we're going to have 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 6. So basically 10, 11, 16, 18, 19, right? But if you think about it, those numbers are already existing here, right? So if it takes two, two levels to get to this stuff, when it only takes one level to get to it in this other branch, then we're just repeating stuff unnecessarily. So we don't actually need to explore anything from the zeroth tree. That will already be explored in these other branches. Um, yeah, that's the best I can explain that. Uh, pretty much just, um, I mean, if you think about it, the zero on the left side of any number is just, you know, the rest of the numbers in the, in the sequence. So this zero is not really adding any value to this number. It's just um, it's actually going to just be lagging behind by one digit every time. That's why this 10 to 19 stuff gets called um, at the first level, whereas this 10 to 19 gets called at the second level here, and that's why it's just repeating um, unnecessary stuff. So another thing you should note is that, um, you know, we're appending to the right of the current number, right? So if we have 10, we're going to append the 0, 1, 6, 8, 9 to the right of 10. Um, as opposed to putting the zero at the beginning. And um, I guess you could try to do at the beginning, but it just gets a little bit sloppy. And, um, you know, like, think about it. Here's an example where you put it at the beginning as opposed to the end of the number. Um, then, the, then the counting just gets kind of all sloppy and stuff, right? Because you go from 11 to 61 to 81 to 91. So that, that counting is just all over the place. So it's easier if you just append it at the end. And also just in code, it's easier to write it by appending to the end. Like by appending to the end, you're pretty much just going to times this current number by 10 and then uh, pl um, plus whatever last digit you have to the end of it. Um, whereas if you were to put it at the beginning, you'd have to like take the length of this current thing and then multiply um, that length by 10 and then... Um, it's a, it's a little bit more involved. I mean, it's not really much harder, but it's just cleaner to, to append stuff at the end. So let me explain to you how our time complexity is O of log n. So let, I, just, I actually just wrote out every single possible number we're going to create from 0 to 100. So if, if our input was 100 instead of 20, these are all the numbers that we'd be creating. I'm not saying all these numbers are, val are valid, confusing numbers, but I'm just saying these are all the numbers that we would generate. And, um, you know, we're not going to actually generate every single number from 0 to 100. We're only going to generate these ones. So if you count how many this are, these are, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, so 5 times 4, so 20, 24, 25. There's about 25 numbers, right? So we're only looking at 25 out of the 100 numbers from 0 to 100. So you can already see that this is a uh, time complexity of n over 4, right? We're only going to look at one fourth of the things in the range of 0 to 100. If you apply the same logic to 100 to 1000 in this range, if you look at it, 100, we're only going to look at 25, right? Because I just told you there's 25 numbers if the range is 100. And then same same thing goes for 600 to 699. There's another 25 numbers. Same thing goes for 800 to 899. There's another 25. Same thing goes for 900 to 999. There's another 25 numbers we'll generate. So if you add that up, 25 plus 25 plus 25, plus 25 that's 100. So for in this range of 100 to 1,000, we're only processing 100 numbers. So that's pretty much a magnitude of n over 10, right? So of these 1,000 numbers, we're only going to be processing 100. So that's n over 10. And then if we say, apply the same logic to 1,000 to 10,000, then, you know, I already told you there's, we're only processing 100 numbers out of 1,000. And then so if you look at the 1,000s, you're only going to process 100 numbers. If you look at the 6,000s, you're only going to process 100 numbers. Same thing with 8,000, 9,000. So if you add this up, that's 400 numbers. So if in the range of 1,000 to 100, to, to 10,000, you're only processing about 400 numbers. So the factor is already n over 25. And you can see how the factor grew. 9, 9 over 4, 9 over 10, 9 over 25, right? So that's going to just, so that means once you get to like 1 billion or something, the, the, the growth is just like literally so stagnant, like, right? You know, if the number on the, if the denominator keeps increasing, then you're literally going to have a, like a, 
a time complexity that just plateaus and just you know grows horizontally so that's a log n type of um, equation all right I tried my best to explain backtracking hopefully you guys can understand that if you didn't um, maybe try looking at some other YouTube resources on uh, maybe backtracking visualized or maybe try to look at the um, you know combinations leak code problem or permutations or subsets or whatever those are other good backtracking approaches and I'll have the description I'll have the code in the description so you can see how I wrote out the code all right thanks for watching and hope you learned something have a good day